Number 9. Loaded Handgun In a shocking incident that took place in 2015 in Whitehall, New York, Judge Robert J. Patorti was removed from the bench by the state's highest court for an appalling act of racism and unprofessional conduct. The incident in question involved Judge Patorti pulling out a loaded semi-automatic handgun in court, claiming that he felt threatened by a black defendant he referred to as a big black man. New York's Court of Appeals unanimously ruled that Judge Patorti exploited a racist stereotype, displaying bias or implicit bias against the defendant. The court found that the defendant posed no actual threat and Judge Patorti's actions were unjustified. While judges are permitted to carry concealed firearms on the bench, they can only brandish them when they believe deadly force is being used. In this case, Judge Patorti displayed no remorse for his actions, even going so far as to brag about the incident to other judges and a college journalist repeatedly making irrelevant racial remarks. Furthermore, the court deemed Judge Patorti unfit for office when he fundraised for a local Elks Lodge on social media in 2021, a prohibited activity for judges. Robert Tembekchian, the administrator for the State Commission on Judicial Conduct, which brought the case against Judge Patorti, emphasized that brandishing a loaded weapon in court without provocation or justification is inexcusable and incompatible with the role of a judge. Patorti's racially inappropriate remarks didn't help his case either. In an interview with a journalism student, Judge Patorti claimed that he drew his weapon in response to someone rushing toward him, but it was later revealed that the defendant didn't pose a legitimate threat. Judge Patorti repeatedly exaggerated the defendant's physical stature, falsely describing him as agitated, big, and built like a football player. Despite the charges against him, Judge Patorti's re-election failed to deter the Court of Appeals from its decision to remove him from the bench, highlighting the gravity of his actions and their incompatibility with the responsibilities of a judge. Number 8. Jaleel Smith Riley in a dramatic courtroom scene in Hamilton County in 2016, Jaleel Smith Riley found himself facing a life sentence after attempting to withdraw his guilty plea in a three-year-old murder case. 23-year-old Smith Riley had initially pleaded guilty to charges of aggravated murder and attempted murder, but later had a change of heart against the advice of his attorneys. However, Hamilton County Common Pleas Judge Charles Kubicki refused his plea withdrawal and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The courtroom took a shocking turn when Smith Riley collapsed to the floor upon receiving his sentence. Police quickly intervened, helping him to his feet, but then Smith Riley interrupted the proceedings by asking about someone's fate, although it remained unclear who he was referring to. Smith Riley's legal team hinted at a likely appeal, though no formal filing had been made at the time. The case revolved around a 2013 armed robbery in Norwood, where Smith Riley and two other men were involved. Smith Riley approached a parked car, knocked on a window with a handgun, and then proceeded to shoot one of the occupants, Aaron Martin, in the head, while also firing shots at Portia Brooks, who tragically died three days later. Smith Riley had previously confessed to the crime and the court found him guilty despite his attempt to withdraw his plea. During the proceedings, family members of the victim spoke out, asking for the maximum penalty for Smith Riley. Portia Brooks' mother, Sharon Brooks, emotionally expressed the devastating impact on their lives and pleaded for justice. Portia's sister, Tia Marie Brooks, also requested a life sentence without parole for Smith Riley, as they had to face life without their loved one. The courtroom drama and the emotional testimonies only added to the intensity of the case. Number 7. Houston Courtroom Brawl in a courtroom drama in Houston in October 2023, a shocking incident unfolded during a hearing for the murder of 16-year-old Diamond Alvarez. Her ex-boyfriend, Frank De Leon, had pleaded guilty to her murder, accepting a 45-year prison sentence as part of a plea deal. Alvarez had been brutally shot 22 times while walking her dog in January 2022. The tragedy occurred after she discovered that De Leon had entered another relationship while they were still dating. She planned to meet him to discuss their relationship when the fatal shooting took place. During the court hearing, Alvarez's mother, Ana Malchado, delivered a victim impact statement and, in a moment of intense emotion, approached De Leon. A bailiff quickly intervened to prevent any altercation. However, Alvarez's uncle rushed toward De Leon, leading to a brief scuffle, and De Leon's mother got involved as well, shoving Alvarez's mom. 
Order was eventually restored by courtroom officials, and the incident left a lasting impression on those present. Mercado, after the hearing, expressed her anger and later apologized, acknowledging that the outburst was wrong. De Leon's trial was set to begin that week, but he opted for the plea agreement, which stipulates that he must serve at least half of his 45-year sentence before becoming eligible for parole. The case was described by Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg as a heartbreaking example of domestic violence, underscoring the dangers of intimate partner violence. The District Attorney's Office has dedicated considerable resources to raising awareness about such cases to prevent similar tragedies from happening. Number 6. Florida's Fighting Judge In June 2014, an ordinary legal dispute in a Florida courtroom took a bizarre turn, resulting in the removal of Brevard County Circuit Judge John Murphy from the bench. The incident involved a heated argument between Assistant Public Defender Andrew Weinstock and Judge Murphy over Weinstock's refusal to waive his client's right to a speedy trial. During the exchange, Judge Murphy unexpectedly lost his composure, shouting at Weinstock and even making a physical threat. He said, You know, if I had a rock, I would throw it at you right now. Stop pissing me off. Just sit down. I'll take care of this. I don't need your help. Sit down. Weinstock, however, stood his ground, asserting his right to be present and represent his client. This exchange escalated further when Murphy challenged Weinstock to a physical altercation outside the courtroom, saying, I said sit down, if you want to fight let's go out back and I'll just beat your ass. The two men then left the courtroom and were involved in a scuffle, with Murphy alleging that Weinstock threw the first punch, while Weinstock claimed Murphy hit him twice in the face. The courtroom audience, having witnessed the entire episode, responded with claps and laughter when Murphy returned and said, Well, I'm an old man. However, the incident quickly gained notoriety, and Judge Murphy became known as the Fighting Judge. In response to the incident, the Florida Supreme Court overturned a previous disciplinary panel's decision and removed Judge Murphy from the bench. The court deemed Murphy's behavior egregious and stated that it demonstrated his unfitness to continue serving as a judge. The court also noted that the judge's actions had eroded public trust in the judicial system and had become a national spectacle, embarrassing Florida's judiciary. The case highlights the importance of maintaining professionalism and decorum in the courtroom, regardless of the circumstances. Judge Murphy's outburst and subsequent physical altercation ultimately led to his removal from the bench, emphasizing the gravity of his misconduct and its impact on the public's faith in the judicial system. Number 5. Demonic Possession The Devil Made Me Do It case, which took place in Connecticut in February 1981, is a bizarre and sensational story in legal history. Aunt Cheyenne Johnson was convicted of first-degree manslaughter for killing his landlord, Alan Bono. But what makes this case truly unusual is that it involved a defense based on a claim of demonic possession and a denial of personal responsibility. The story began with eight-year-old David Glatzel allegedly hosting a demon, leading his family to seek the help of Ed and Lorraine Warren, renowned paranormal investigators. Multiple priests were involved in petitioning the Catholic Church for an exorcism, culminating in a harrowing event where the demon was believed to have transferred from David to Johnson. Several months later, Johnson killed his landlord, and his defense lawyer argued that he was possessed at the time. However, the presiding judge, Robert Callahan, rejected this defense, deeming it unprovable and unscientific, leaving the jury to consider self-defense instead. Johnson was convicted of first-degree manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison as a result, and he went on to serve approximately five years behind bars. The case garnered international media attention, inspiring books, television, films, and ultimately the 2021 movie, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. However, the case's aftermath was marred by controversy, with the Glatzel family suing authors and publishers for violating their rights to privacy, libel, and inflicting emotional distress. Carl Glatzel Jr. claimed that the possession story was a hoax orchestrated by the Warrens to exploit the family, leading to the family's downfall. Despite Despite these disputes, though, the case remains a unique and eerie chapter in legal history, blending supernatural claims with a courtroom drama that captivated the world's attention. And these days, it continues to be a source of fascination and intrigue in popular culture.
Number four, racist remarks from the judge. In a courtroom twist that's both surprising and concerning, two New Jersey judges faced reprimands for making inappropriate remarks that touched on race, ethnicity, and physical disabilities during court proceedings in January 2008. One of the judges, James Sitter from Ocean County, faced criticism for ridiculing a defendant's English-speaking abilities and making a comparison to O.J. Simpson. His comments arose when a defense lawyer cited communication issues with the defendant's parole officer, who didn't speak Spanish. Sitter's response, as reported by the New Jersey Law Journal, was controversial. Sitter expressed frustration about various forms of assistance provided to the defendant, including public support and free health care, and said he wanted a bilingual probation officer. He even suggested that the defendant should be sent back to Mexico, stating, I take you just as you're dressed and bound right now and have you escorted back to Mexico forthwith and forget the prison term. And in another instance, he made unfavorable comparisons to O.J. Simpson. The other judge, James Convery from Essex County, faced reprimand for asking a Hispanic lawyer when she became an illegal alien and for making jokes about her litigant's hearing aid as well as their hip and knee replacements. In the end, both judges waived a hearing and accepted a reprimand from the Advisory Committee on Judicial Conduct. Sitter acknowledged that being a criminal court judge had taken a toll on him, leading to comments that were better left unsaid. However, the incidents remind us of the importance of maintaining professionalism and sensitivity in the courtroom, where people from diverse backgrounds seek justice. The reprimand sent a clear message about the need for judges to conduct themselves with the utmost decorum, regardless of the challenges they might face in their roles. Number 3. Surprise Sentencing In August 2012, an Ohio high school basketball star, Tony Farmer, had his life's trajectory altered dramatically when he received a three-year prison sentence after pleading guilty to kidnapping, felonious assault, and other charges. Farmer, a six-foot-seven forward at Garfield Heights High School, had initially aspired to receive probation, and his teachers, coaches, and family members had testified on his behalf. However, as the judge pronounced the prison sentence, Farmer collapsed into the arms of a sheriff's deputy and fell to the ground in anguish. Adding a bizarre twist to the situation, the victim in the case was Farmer's ex-girlfriend, Andrea Lane. Although the two had separated following Farmer's attack on Lane in April, she'd pleaded with Judge Pamela Barker not to send him to prison. Lane expressed her belief in Farmer's inherent goodness, saying, I know he was a good person. I hope he still is. The entire courtroom scene was emotionally charged and difficult to watch, primarily because Farmer had a promising future before the incident occurred. Prior to a video capturing his altercation with Lane, Farmer was a highly regarded basketball prospect, ranked in the top 100, and had garnered interest from prominent colleges such as Ohio State, Xavier, Dayton, and Michigan State. While it's important to acknowledge the wrongdoing of Farmer and the appropriateness of his punishment, the consequences of his actions were severe. Unless Judge Barker decided to reduce his sentence during a review in 180 days, Farmer's dreams of playing major college basketball were seemingly shattered. Number 2. Cyanide Pills in a startling turn of events in a Phoenix courtroom in July 2012, a former Wall Street trader, Michael Marin, collapsed after being found guilty of arson. And it's since been revealed that Marin took his own life by ingesting cyanide, according to an autopsy report released by the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office. The autopsy's toxicology tests confirmed the presence of cyanide in Marin's system, shedding light on the mysterious circumstances surrounding his courtroom collapse and subsequent death. The report also mentioned an apparent end-of-life note that Marin had emailed shortly before his passing, as well as the discovery of cyanide in his car. The case had its origins in 2009, when Marin made a bizarre escape from his burning mansion in the Phoenix area. Wearing scuba gear, he emerged from the inferno, leading to a series of legal proceedings that culminated in his arson conviction. The courtroom episode, where Marin appeared to ingest something from a sports bottle after the verdict was read, was a bewildering and tragic conclusion to his legal ordeal. The revelation of his death by cyanide added a chilling layer to an already perplexing and tragic tragic case, showcasing the complexity of human behavior and the unexpected twists that can occur in a courtroom setting.
And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. Number one, a serial killer's proposal. During the 1980 Orlando trial for the kidnapping and murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, a bizarre courtroom proposal took place. Carol Ann Boone took the stand, intending to marry Ted Bundy. Unable to find a minister to officiate the ceremony and facing opposition from Bundy's defense attorney, she discovered an arcane legal loophole. Under an obscure Florida law, a public declaration made in open court in the presence of court officers could make the marriage valid. Representing himself, Bundy questioned Boone about their relationship. And when Bundy suddenly popped the question, asking, do you want to marry me, Boone said yes. However, Bundy initially botched his response by saying, I do want to marry you. But after further questioning from the prosecution and another proposal, Bundy corrected his phrasing, and they were married in a truly surreal courtroom moment. 9. Keith Moses 38-year-old Nathacha Augustin stopped along a street in Pine Hills, Florida, to offer a young man a ride one day in 2022. And in response, he shot her and fled the scene. Several hours later, Spectrum News 13 journalists Dylan Lyons and Jesse Walden were shot nearby while covering the first shooting. Lyons died from his wounds, but Walden survived with critical injuries. The gunman then proceeded to a home a few streets over and shot a mother and daughter. Sadly, only the mother lived. Police identified the suspect as 19-year-old Keith Moses. He had no known connections to any of the victims except the first person he shot, and the motive behind his alleged crime spree remains unclear. Footage of the suspect's arrest shows several armed deputies approaching Moses on a street. He initially cooperated with their demands, then suddenly yelled, they are killing me. As the cops handcuffed him, Moses then screamed that he couldn't breathe, but a deputy assured him that he could. One of the arresting deputies then speculated that Moses was on some sort of drug. The suspect now faces three first-degree murder charges, two attempted murder charges, and one count of armed burglary. There hasn't been a conclusion to the case yet, but hopefully Moses will get what he deserves. 8. Mark Brown 34-year-old British escort Alexandra Morgan vanished in 2021 after traveling to a remote farm in East Sussex to meet a man who sought her services online. By the time her remains were found, all that was left of her were some charred bone fragments and teeth. While investigating Morgan's case, detectives zeroed in on a 40-year-old man named Mark Brown as their prime suspect. They discovered that Brown's girlfriend, 33-year-old Leah Ware, had disappeared just months earlier. The two had met in a similar fashion as Brown and Morgan. And for several months, Brown paid for Ware's apartment while carrying out the relationship behind his partner's back. No sign of Ware was ever found, but law enforcement believes that she met a similar end to Morgan, who was locked in a shipping container and kept alive for a certain amount of time before being murdered and burned. When police showed up at Brown's home to arrest him, it didn't seem totally unexpected. He remained calm as an officer explained what he was being taken into custody for and asked if he had anything to say. Brown declined to comment and cooperated with law enforcement. A jury convicted him of both murders, and as a consequence of his horrific actions, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 49 years. 7. David Carrick For two decades, an elite London Metropolitan Police officer named David Carrick terrorized an unknown number of women, using his job position to intimidate them into submission, forcing them to stay quiet about his abuse. One woman accused Carrick of threatening to plant drugs in her car if she stopped seeing him. He also allegedly threatened to murder the victim and told her that nobody would believe her over a high-ranking member of law enforcement. He also reminded her that he knew how to make evidence disappear. Other accounts described how Carrick degraded his victims for hours on end, in some cases forcing them to sit in a tiny cupboard 
while doing other horrific things to them. An investigation found at least nine complaints that women filed against Carrick between 2000 and 2021, including reports of alleged assaults, but no action was taken. And the paper trail ended there when the women either dropped the complaints or declined to formally pursue action. In one case, Carrick was put on administrative duties, but kept his job despite the seriousness of the allegations he faced. The case finally broke wide open in 2021, when a woman who met Carrick on a Tinder date reported his behavior. In footage of the arrest, the crooked cop seems annoyed to the point of acting arrogant, as if he couldn't believe some low-ranking officers were daring to take a 20-year-old veteran of the force into custody. Carrick's fall off his high horse only continued from there. He was ultimately convicted of 85 crimes against 12 different women and was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years. However, authorities believe there are more victims and are encouraging them to come forward. 6. Porfirio Duerta Herrera 42-year-old Porfirio Duerta Herrera got a three-day head start on his prison escape in September of 2022 thanks to the inattentiveness of guards who didn't notice that he'd replaced himself with a cardboard dummy. He'd used battery acid to wear away at the window frame of his cell, then ran past an unmanned tower and scaled the facility's perimeter fence. At the time of his escape, Duerte Herrera was serving a life sentence, or at least was supposed to be for detonating a pipe bomb on top of a parking garage along the Las Vegas Strip in 2007. Unfortunately, as a result of the blast, a hot dog stand worker lost his life. Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak was outraged by the security breach, as well as the fact that nobody noticed Duerte Herrera had escaped until days later. A multi-agency manhunt ensued and police caught up with the fugitive right as he was about to board a bus out of town, thanks to a keen-eyed employee who recognized Duerte Herrera and called 911. Footage shows officers closing in on the fleeing felon as he waited in line to board a shuttle bus. At first glance, nothing about him stood out. He was wearing new clothes and a baseball cap and had a backpack on. And in the video, an officer can be heard warning Duerte Herrera not to be stupid as they slap the cuffs on him and lead him over to a police vehicle. He didn't say much, but acknowledged that they had the person they were looking for, and admitted that he was trying to get to Tijuana. It's unclear how Duerte Herrera reached Las Vegas from the prison, which is located in the open desert northwest of the city, or how he got his hands on money to buy clothing and a bus ticket. Footage showed someone dropping him off in Las Vegas two days after his escape but the driver hasn't yet been identified. And after he was captured, officials made the wise decision to move him to a high security prison in order to avoid any incidents like this in the future. Five, Katron Dones. While responding to a domestic violence call during the early morning hours one day in 2022, Broward County Sheriff's deputies arrived at a home in West Park, Florida to find a young man banging on the front door. Identified in an arrest affidavit as 19-year-old Katron Dones, the suspect allegedly showed up at the residence after his girlfriend found out he was cheating and decided she wanted nothing to do with him. The young woman told police that when he appeared at her door, she dialed 911 and went outside to tell him to leave. She claimed that Dones pushed his way inside, but that she managed to lock him out. Body cam footage shows a deputy approaching Dones with his gun drawn, as he instructs the suspect to stop kicking the door and sit down. Dones challenged the deputy and said he lived at the house. And despite his violent actions, his girlfriend told the responding officers that she didn't want him detained, just that she wanted him to go home. When a deputy approached the suspect and attempted to handcuff him, a struggle ensued at which point the officer's body cam fell off. The woman who called the cops could be heard begging the police not to shoot Dones and to stop punching him. Other deputies arrived, and at some point, one of their cameras captured grainy footage of what looked like a deputy punching Dones while using a pair of handcuffs like brass knuckles. 
By then, the suspect was already in cuffs and was unable to defend himself. In early 2023, the Broward Public Defender's Office filed a complaint accusing the deputy who allegedly punched Doans with handcuffs of excessive force. According to the Sun Sentinel, some experts have condemned the deputy's actions as excessive based on the incomplete body cam footage alone. Others, however, believe the deputies may have acted reasonably based on the possibility that Doans posed a continued threat, even if he was already handcuffed. The case remains under administrative review, so it's unclear whether any of the deputies involved in the incident will see consequences for their actions. 4. Cindy Taylor Adult performer Cindy Taylor, better known as Jessie Jane, made headlines for reasons other than her talent in 2020 when she was arrested for allegedly punching and biting her boyfriend in a booze-fueled rage. Police were called to the couple's home in Moore, Oklahoma, where they learned that the two of them had started arguing after drinking together. When they arrived, they found Taylor's boyfriend bleeding in the driveway. The alleged victim told responding officers that he awoke to the 39-year-old, throwing his medication in the garbage because she believed it was steroids. He claimed that Taylor reacted violently when he confronted her about the discarded pills. Taylor accused her boyfriend of picking her up by the neck and throwing her against a wall. But officers observed no visible injuries. And this wasn't her first run-in with the law involving alcohol-induced drama. In one incident that was captured on camera, she was found passed out drunk on a sidewalk, soaked in her own urine. After trying to get Taylor to call a friend or a cab to come pick her up for several minutes, the police got frustrated with her lack of cooperation and booked her on a public intoxication charge. Taylor told the Daily Mail that she only had two drinks that night and that someone had drugged her. She gave a similar explanation after she was filmed passed out and being carried down the Las Vegas Strip. She seems to be staying out of news headlines since her most recent arrest, though, and she's also retired from her performing career. 3. Velveteen Dream In August of 2022, Orlando police officers responded to a report about an altercation at a local gym. Former WWE wrestler Patrick Clark, better known as Velveteen Dream, allegedly bit and punched an employee who asked him to leave a certain part of the facility that was closed for cleaning. Clark immediately demanded to speak to his lawyer after being handcuffed. When the officers didn't let him, he threatened to sue and erupted into a verbal tirade that continued through the entire ride to the police station. In footage of the arrest, the wrestler could be heard screaming so loudly in a squad car that an officer turned the radio up to drown out the noise coming from the back seat. He also shouted that he worked for WWE, although he'd already left his position with the company more than a year earlier. During another part of the video, Clark admitted to being a little inebriated. He accused an officer of failing to read him his Miranda rights, and he remained stuck on the topic for several minutes. At the police station, he continued to berate the cop, calling him a rookie repeatedly and asking how he could have messed up on giving someone their Miranda rights. In the end, Clark was charged with misdemeanor battery and trespassing on property after receiving a warning, but the case was dropped when the gym employee decided he wasn't interested in pursuing the case. 2. Hope Solo In March of 2022, Police received a report about a woman passed out in her vehicle with the engine running. She'd apparently been there for more than an hour outside a Walmart in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They arrived to find that the driver was 40-year-old Hope Solo, the former goalkeeper of the U.S. national women's soccer team. Body cam footage showed the athlete refusing to cooperate with law enforcement while her toddler twins cried in the back seat of the car. Solo said she'd pulled into the parking lot to take a nap because she was tired, but the responding officer suspected that there was more to the story than she was claiming. He asked Solo how much she'd had to drink, but she denied consuming any alcohol and refused to exit her vehicle or take a field sobriety test. As a result, Solo was charged with driving while intoxicated, resisting arrest, and misdemeanor child abuse. She pleaded guilty to the DWI charge, but the other two were ultimately dropped. The judge imposed a two-year suspended sentence and a 30-day active sentence. 
and she was credited with time served for spending a month in rehab. In a statement, Solo acknowledged her mistake and said she'd underestimated the damaging effects that alcohol had on her life. 1. Gerardson Mackey When Ackworth, Georgia police chief Wayne Dennard spotted what looked like an unmarked police car one day in 2022, he didn't recognize it as a vehicle belonging to any known department that operates in the area. He saw the car making its way through traffic with its red and white emergency lights flashing and instructed one of his officers to pull it over. Body cam footage showed what appeared to be a retired police car that was still equipped with a lot of the gear that would have been used when it was still in service, including a caged back seat. And while it's not necessarily illegal to own one of these vehicles, it's against the law for someone to use the flashing lights if they're not actually a cop. The driver, 33-year-old Gerardson Mackey, was wearing a police uniform with patches that said Georgia on them. He also had on a utility belt, and he flashed a badge at the approaching officer. Mackey said the uniform was his private funeral escort company and identified himself as an off-duty highway emergency response operator, or hero operator, for the State Department of Transportation. He was somewhat defiant at the scene when the police cited him for unlawful operation of an emergency vehicle. After some further digging, they revealed that Mackey had been fired from his Department of Transportation job before the traffic stop took place. And so, authorities charged him with one felony count of impersonating a public officer or employee. Would you rather witness a jaw-dropping once-in-a-lifetime courtroom drama or hear a mind-boggling unbelievable courtroom story from a reliable source? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.